Hello and welcome to this British Academy event. I'm Frahana Hyder, I'm a journalist and broadcaster and a presenter for the BBC World Service's Witness History programme, which looks at important events in history through the eyes of the people who were there. Founded in 1902, the British Academy is the UK's leading organisation for the humanities and social sciences. They are an independent fellowship of world leading scholars, a funding body that supports new research nationally and internationally, and a forum for debate and engagement. Today's event is the first in a series called Why History, in which we'll be joined by leading uh, British Academy Fellows and funded researchers to discuss insights from the past which help us make sense of the present. Today's event, I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Dr. Sadia Qureshi. Sadia is a British Academy Mid-Career Fellow and Senior Lecturer in Modern, British, in Modern History at the University of Birmingham. She specialises in the history of race, science and empire. Her award-winning book, Peoples on Parade, Exhibitions, Empire and Anthropology in 19th Century Britain, explored the displays and exhibitions of foreign people in Britain during the Victorian period. Considering the lasting legacy such exhibitions have had on our perceptions of race and science. Sadia is currently working on the history of extinction from the Mastodon to today's current climate crisis and connecting these to the histories of race and empire. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Sadia to our virtual stage for a discussion about her fascinating and wide reaching research. She and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes before taking a selection of audience questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please post it in the YouTube chat section. You're of course welcome to tweet during the event and can copy in at British Academy. Welcome, Sadia. Thank Let's you so begin much. With your <laughs> You're welcome. Let's begin with your first book, Peoples on Parade, which looked at human exhibitions featuring people from across the world in the 19th century. This is a concept that I think many don't know too much about. Can you explain what these exhibitions were, who went to them and how they work? Yes, so we're quite used to the idea that if we want to learn about foreign peoples, we might watch a TV documentary or maybe fly out to places and uh, go and visit places. But often that's not an option in the 19th century, obviously not with television. Uh, but before the era of cheap travel, that's not available either. But one option that is available, apart from reading literature, is to go to a local gallery, uh, a local theatre or so on, and see living foreign peoples performing. So throughout the 19th century, there are entrepreneurs, managers, show people who bring over groups of foreign peoples to perform songs and dances and rites. And they're advertised as a chance to meet and greet uh, foreign peoples and learn about their what we call manners and customs. Um, so they're a, a really, really important way um, of encountering foreign peoples in, within Britain in the 19th century. And you see all sorts of different kinds of people uh, brought to Britain, for instance, from Arabs uh, and the so-called last of the Aztecs right through to Zulus. I mean, today we find the idea of these shows, I mean, dreadful to imagine. But as you've said, they were very popular at the time. Why do you think that was? What drew people to them? I think if you take a city like London, for instance, it's a huge multicultural city and it's very, very easy to see ethnic difference. Um, over the last years, for, over the last few years, for instance, we've seen a huge outpouring of interest, for instance, in the British black presence. So it's very, very easy to see ethnic difference in London. But if you are somebody who wants to learn about different races and different peoples, you can't just go and accost people on the streets. So one of the things that managers tap into is that desire to encounter, to meet and greet foreign peoples. And that that's a really, really important element of the shows. Um, so, for instance, you know, there are lots of accounts of people visiting the shows and um, doing their best to try and uh, speak to foreign peoples. There's often translators on hand. Um, and the other really, really important reason, apart from that interaction, is political relevance. So. 
1879, for instance, during the midst of the Anglo-Zulu War, there's an entrepreneur called the Great Farini. He has an incredible moustache. He's very, very distinctive, um, who is known for importing Africans. And in 1879, he imports a group that he calls, that he labels and markets as the friendly Zulus, uh, Farini's friendly Zulus, and they're friendly because they're fighting on the British side. And that is a very, very important example of some of a manager and entrepreneur taking advantage of British political and military activity in the colonies to generate interest in a very, very particular people and bringing them bringing them over to Britain. And so there's a combination of desire to meet people and encounter people combined with this kind of broader political and um, importance of colonized peoples. And of course, the other really, really important thing is that different empires import different people. So for instance, it's, you can see these shows in somewhere like Paris, but there, what tends to happen is that you tend to get people from West Africa or French colonies, whereas in Britain, it tends to be more like Southern Africa, for instance, and British colonies there. So there are deeply, deeply political reasons why people are interested in the shows, as well as just curiosity. And what about the performers? Do we have examples of what the performers thought of being in these exhibitions? Um, do we know what happened to them after the shows ended? I mean, in your research, did you come across particular stories that you that have stayed with you and that you thought were particularly important? This is one of the most difficult things to understand and get at because there are so few sources. Um, almost nothing survives from people themselves, either because they didn't necessarily record things like that, especially if they come from oral cultures, or it tends to be because the shows are written about and performers are written about rather than interviewed directly and so on. But it is possible to read between the lines, whether that's in newspaper reports and reviews of the shows, or sometimes um, managers will write memoirs, for instance, where they talk about their experiences of going on tour and they will talk about the performers then. And those kinds of sources often do give us gl glimpses into the lives of performers and their experiences. And I think one of the most extraordinary stories that I came across was a group of Zulus who were brought over in 1853 and they're put on show in Hyde Park Corner. And, you know, this is very, very early to see Zulus in London. So there's a huge interest in them. And one day the Zulus are, are on a break effectively in between shows and they're standing around outside um, the venue um, enjoying fresh air and so on. And the manager gets upset because essentially he doesn't want people to have a free show. He asks the troupe to go back inside. Um, they refuse and a scuffle ensue, ensues and violence breaks out, between, and especially between the manager and the leader, the circle chief of the troupe called Manios. The manager, Caldecott, gets very, very worried about this and he, he effectively gets police to apprehend Manios. And there's accounts of what happens when Manios appears in court in response um, to having been taken uh, into custody. And Manios is uh, kind of justified. The judge asks him why he essentially why he was violent or aggressive. And Manios responds by saying, I know I'm under contract to make, uh, you know, to be exhibited and to take part in these shows, but there's nothing to stop me going outside. But also, um, I am a man that should be respected and I should not be treated that way. Um, mm -hmm. And he has a very, very clear sense that as the chief, he should not have been treated in such a disrespectful way uh, by the manager, Caldecott. And eventually the judge um, basically releases Manios and tells him to behave. Now that is just such an extraordinary story. The idea of a Zulu in court in 1853, arguing not only about the nature of his contract and what it involves, but also about his social status. So every now and then we see these glimpses into these experiences of performance that are just so important. Um, for me, that's one of the most striking, but there are other examples, for instance, of people getting married or having relationships. So in, for instance, in the, during, throughout the 1840s, there are various Native American people um, that are put on display by uh, an exhibition uh, a, a famous painter uh, by uh, a guy called George Kaplan. And in 1844, um, uh, for instance, he brings over a troupe. And 
at his shows, one of his tr um, translator um, actually meets a woman, Sarah Haynes, for instance. And, you know, that that encounter leads to them being married, Alexander Kodot, and they, they get married and eventually they move abroad. And so there are these there are these entire lives that are lived outside of the exhibition venues are really, really important aspects of what the shows mean that are difficult to get at, but we can get glimpses of them through any source and that tells us about the encounter between performers and showgoers and managers. That's really fascinating. You said that the scientists and anthropologists who attended the displays alongside the general public are especially interesting to you. Why is that? There are several reasons. I think when I first began researching the shows, my overwhelming feeling was that people tended to think of them as imperial spectacle and little more. Uh, something that was important for like jingoistic reasons, for instance, but not much else. But I'm trained as a historian of science and I felt that there was much more to the story. And I felt that actually the shows left really, really important legacies that we can see if we look at how anthropologists use them. So anthropologists would attend the shows just, uh, you know, as keenly as lay people would. But they also used the shows for their own research in various kinds of ways. So they weren't just consumers. For instance, they would often set up um, private meetings with the performers, for instance, so that they could, um, you know, guide those encounters in, uh, to, the, to the benefit of their research. Sometimes they would perform experiments on people, for instance. Um, unfortunately, sometimes performers pass away abroad um, for all sorts of reasons, whether it's ill health or, for, in, for instance, in those circumstances, some, sometimes anthropologists quite literally appropriate the bodies of displayed peoples for their research and conduct autopsies and so on. So there are, there's, a, there's a way in which performers quite literally become experimental material. But even the shows themselves are really, really important for anthropologists in various ways. So if we think of 1886, there's the, the Colonial Indian Ind Exhibition that happens in South Kensington in London. And there are many, many displayed peoples brought over, dozens of, um, of different ethnicities and so on. Now, even in a city like London, with the kind of ethnic diversity it has, it would be very, very difficult to encounter a group of such a wide variety of ethnicities in one place. And the anthropologists are really keen to take care of, take advantage of that. So, for instance, they hold conferences at the ex uh, uh, in relationship to the exhibition. Um, Curators will take them around the shows and show them specimens and so on in display, and they will talk about them in relationship to their own theorizing, um, and then they will publish journal articles and so on with them. And effectively, what they're doing is using the exhibition ground as a training ground to learn to recognize different kinds of people and also to conduct research on different kinds of ethnicities. So, for instance, if you're really interested in anthropology, physical anthropology, you know, the sites become mm. this place effectively mini laboratories where you can uh, conduct research on these questions and for me that's really really crucial because it's an important way in which the shows have lasting legacies for how we think about race. I mean bringing up your point there I mean how do you think the modern perception of race and empire has been affected by these exhibitions and by the scientists who who attended them? Well, at the most basic level, these shows, and um, particularly the anthropologists and so on that are involved in them, help us define who we think of as human and how we think of as uh, racial variation is developing. So, for instance, in the early 19th century or the late 18th century or you know, throughout the 18th century, for instance, um, it's very, very common to think of ethnic difference as arising from climate. So people will often argue that races that live closer to the sun, uh, sorry, to the equator, for instance, because they're more exposed to the sun will be darker. Um, and, to, and then that will be associated with any, any number of kind of social cultural forms of organization. But in the later 19th century, people to start to tend to kind of dispute those kinds of theories and other kinds of theories emerge. And at their most extreme, people will go as far as arguing that different races of people constitute different species. 
that's quite a minority view. But the fact that that debate is happening in the 19th century at all shows what's at stake in terms of defining who is human and what does variation between humans mean. And of course, anthropologists are involved in those debates as well as you know, or any number of scientists and so on. And that's why in doing research on these shows, anthropologists and, and these performers have such an important lasting legacy for, for our ideas about race. So as you say, a lasting legacy. Um, and we've said how popular they were in the 18th century, but in some cases they continued into the 20th century. Um, do we have more recent examples? I mean, did you come across more recent examples in your research? Yeah, I often do. Um, I mean, the shows continue right through to the 1930s and world fairs are ongoing. So, you know, people will have, um, for instance, national displays at world fairs and so on. But I think there are other venues, in, but not necessarily exhibited in that kind of way, living people in that way. But one of the examples that really, really stands out to me is that I was in Australia several years ago, I was conducting research. Um, and I took a day off and I booked a day trip to go to a local mountain range. Um, and it was absolutely stunning, but the tour operator had arranged as part of the tour day, day trip to basically see a performance by Aboriginal people. And the whole performance was supposed to be them performing various rites and songs. And for me, that instantly resonated with the 19th century shows. And I felt very uncomfortable with it, especially with the way. So it was in a kind of shopping mall um, and there was a small section devoted uh, to the show. And it was um, made up to look like, a, like a, almost a, 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 the most bizarre sort of jungle theme straw huts and mm. stuff like that outside in terms of the entrance um i felt very uncomfortable with it and i wanted to know a little bit more about it so i asked a couple of the performers and they were quite reluctant to speak to me for obvious reasons and i asked them whether they themselves had come up with the idea of the shows or whether they were being managed for instance and effectively they said somebody non-aboriginal was in control of the show itself and it was effectively um being run uh, for tourists for profit and that to me felt deeply, deeply uncomfortable. Um, and they were very clear they were doing it because they needed a job. And, you know, so there are ways in which the, that sense of exploiting ethnic difference for profit does appear in modern kind of context. Often it's things like folk performances and stuff. Um, and I think people don't necessarily even realize that there is this longer history attached to those kinds of performances. Um, I didn't go in to see the show. I just, I couldn't, simply couldn't bear the idea of it because I know how ex exploitative a history those shows have. And of course that would it could have been a very, very different situation if Aboriginal performers had been in charge of um, the show's content, the context and so on, how they presented themselves. And if it had been done in, for instance, in educational contexts and stuff, but this was very, very much a com commercial for-profit kind of organisation. So they, they do occur, um, and often in some kind of way associated with tourism. So they were on display, as it were. Absolutely, as quite literally on somebody. display, perform as living examples of Aboriginal peoples quite astonishing i mean recently in the news it, it came up um the bronx zoo apologized for displaying um a young congolese teenager otter benga i mean 114 years since he was he was displayed and caged but you know it, it shows how these um exhibitions how the legacies still resonate i mean do you have examples of other places apologizing not off the top of my head I can think of in terms of apologies, but I think the very fact of that apology shows that there is a lasting legacy. Um, mm. Even if we didn't have contemporary examples of these kinds of shows happening, there are all sorts of ways in which peoples are, uh, you know, enter into Western scientific discourse and so on that, in, that are deeply, deeply destructive. So, I mean, one example that's not necessarily an apology so much, but is a repatriation, is that of Sarah Bartman. She was displayed in London from 1810 onwards. She died in 1815. 
She was ex ex exhibited all over the country and in Paris. Um, her body entered um, French museums via um, being, um, she had an autopsy done on her by French scientists called Georges Cuvier. Um, and so her remains remained in a museum until they were eventually repatriated nearly 200 years years after she had died um, and she was buried on International Women's Day and so there are those kinds of moments where slowly museums or governments are recognizing that this that especially the human remains that they have as a result of these kinds of shows that there is a real question about whether those remains should be kept or not and campaigners wanting them back but also ethnographic objects for instance whether they for instance they enter collections and so on if you think of the Field Museum in Chicago, mm. many of its collections um, in, in its originate, uh, at the original point of it being set up, came mm. from the Chicago World's Fair, for instance. So there are, there are all sorts of ways in which um, literally humans, but also objects, enter into collections. And there's a huge question about whether they should be there or not. So I think there, there will be more calls for apologies and more calls for all sorts of um, recompense. Um. I mean, Sally, we've touched on and we've talked about how popular these shows were. Um, did you come across any um, posters or photos that, that have stood out to you? I mean, if you could describe them, that would be really interesting. The, I mean, there's a whole ephemera around shows that are really important um, for various kinds of reasons. So often you will have text saying something like the last of their race or come and see uh, the, the first person of their kind, the first, um, you know, Zulu in the country or something like that. So those kinds of claims are extremely common, especially the sense that either this is the first of their kind or the last of their kind to be exhibited. Um, there's often images, so um, often drawn from travel literature and so on. And in later periods, um, you get things like photographs and so on circulating as postcards and stuff. Sometimes you can buy a photograph of a displayed person at an exhibition or a world fair, for instance, and then they will sign them, for instance. So there's a huge memorabilia around these shows. And they're really, really important because even if you never ever go to a show, if you see these posters, around the venues in which people are being exhibited for instance that allows you to participate in a sort of removed way for instance um, but it means that those shows have an impact far beyond anybody that might actually have the money to attend a show so yeah shows that the poster and the ephemera and stuff like that that come out of that are really really important I mean, do you think the, these shows, I mean, having these exhibitions and these peoples on display, do you think uh, by having them, people, the exhibitions were being seen as their race and who they were was being seen as subhuman? Was that part of, of the legacy of having these exhibitions, denigrating the race entirely? Um. So reactions are often quite varied. There's definitely deeply, deeply racist interpreters who will say things like, you know, uh, you know, that performer was particularly ugly, which is just an example of how that particular people is ugly, for instance, or, or, or are ugly. Um, or, for instance, you know, they, they're just those people weren't intelligent, for instance. There is a whole kind of range of really deeply racist commentary like that. But there are people who are actually quite surprised by performers when they go to shows. So for instance, sometimes um, people will be put on show with their children. So in the 1853 show that I mentioned, The Zulus, uh, one of them is actually a woman who gives birth um, uh, en route, I think, and she has her child with her. And when people see her playing with her child, they will make all sorts of comments about, you know, um, the universality of the maternal instinct, for instance, mm -hmm. and and they will talk about the, how lively the child is and so on. In the same year, there's also a couple of um, young African children put on display called Flora uh, Martinez, and they just they are um, advertisers the Earthmen, and they are really interesting because overwhelmingly press reports describe them as extremely beautiful children. 
Um, I've seen pictures of them. They're absolutely adorable, so I'm not surprised by that. But people often also talk about them as being very, very intelligent, quick-witted, and so on. And they use that, and there's an example of saying anybody who thinks so-called savages are not mm. human can actually go to these shows, see these incredibly intelligent children, and know that that's not true. So there are commentators that use the shows across the spectrum of thinking about race, some in deeply racist ways and others in more favourable terms. But of course, that's not to say that they are saying all human beings are equal. Far be it for me to suggest that mm. at all. They are still relying on deeply hierarchical ways of thinking about humanity. But they do add, they do talk about the shows as opportunities for scholars of humanity to think about the different ways in which people show humanity such as the universal maternal instinct and so on so it is it's a very complicated story about how people respond in, in terms of their interpretations of um their reactions to performers these individual examples that you that you bring up are uh, just fascinating really really interesting um we touched on it before sadia but you know um these people were often um put on display as a last chance to see these races. They're at risk of disappearing. And there was a huge rush by anthropologists to record and document these peoples and their customs at the time. Were the public worried about the loss of these groups? Some people definitely are worried, but others couldn't care less. Um, so for instance, throughout the 19th century, there is serious opposition to the shows. Um, some of the most vocal opponents um, come from um, organ activists such as the Aborigines Protection Society, uh, which is set up in the 1830s. And, and effectively, as a society, they campaign against what they see as the worst excesses of colonial violence and dispossession. And, and effectively, they want a kind of imperial humanitarianism and they want people to behave as better imperialists. So they are constantly talking about how exploitative these shows are and how um, Victorians have a sort of paternalistic responsibility to act as custodians for colonised peoples and they very much to link the shows and their discussions of them to their broader politics about wanting um, to protect colonised peoples from the worst excesses of European imperialism. Again, that's not the same as, you know, wanting, for instance, to uh, to treat them equally, but it, it is um, an important aspect of commentary on the shows. But there are also others that are deeply and profoundly racist that effectively mm -hmm. conflate extermination with extinction. And to them, if colonised peoples are dying out, and they often claim they are, mm -hmm. if they're dying out in the face of colonial contact, then that is simply the law of nature taking its effect. And they will often make claims that uh, extinction is an endemic natural process. It happens in the animal world. It happens wherever different tribes meet, wherever different peoples meet. And as a mm. result, that nobody should uh, feel guilty about this because they see it as a natural course of action within empire. And in fact, I guess the most important and famous example of that is actually Charles Darwin in 1871, when he's talking about extinction and with respect to humans he actually talks mm. about it as you know wherever races meet tribe meets tribe nation meets nation there's likely to be an inequality um and that is likely to lead lead to a form of natural selection where the weaker races are supplanted and many people take that idea up and run with it and so there are many people who are, de are extremely proactive about the idea that as imperialists they should not be worried about extinction happening. But of, and of course, it's really, really important to remember they're not talking about extinction. They're talking about extermination, deliberate warfare and colonial dispossession. But by calling it an extinction, they are um, making particular claims about naturalizing this violence. Fascinating. Really fascinating. I mean, today and now we're, we're sadly all too familiar with the permanent loss of plants and animals. Um, but this was a relatively new concept um, and a new idea during this period. How did this idea of extinction develop? 
in some ways, it, the easiest answer to that is that it develops out of the research of Georges Cuguet, who I mentioned earlier with respect to Bartman, his research on fossil remains. So for instance, between 1796 um, and 1807, he publishes a series of really important papers where he compares the fossilized remains of mastodons, which look like huge mm -hmm. elephants or mammoths, for instance, to modern day um, elephants. And he argues that they are so different that they must constitute different species and that mastodons must be extinct. And before mm. that, people know about extinction in the natural world, if you think of something like the Mauritian dodo, for instance. But in the early mm. modern world, people think of those kinds of extinctions as happening because of human excess. Mm. Um, you know, the dodo being hunted to extinction through, uh, through human actions. But what Cuvier's research shows is that extinction has happened in the deep past and that potentially the nature is full of these lost species because at the point he's writing people often think of extinction they're, they're often very deeply reluctant to imagine the world being full of extinct species because they think of they like to think of the world as being created by god and and that all forms that god have created to be existing uh, be in existence mm. because that would be a perfect creation so there's a deep reluctance to buy into the ideas the idea that you could have permanent loss but it's the kind of detailed research on fossils and so on by people like Cuvier as well as others that slowly establishes the reality of extinction and once it's established it very very quickly is taken up you know within a few decades across the 19th century to think about other forms of beings not just extinct animals but humans people's um, humans languages for instance ancient humans uh, as well as plants and animals Right. And, and what impact did this extinction theory have on the way that um, other people were viewed and other cultures and the environment during this period? Did anyone attempt to prevent these disappearing habitats and communities? One of the strangest things, if you look at the history of extinction, is that in the early period, say in the 1830s, when people talk about extinction, they tend to talk about as something happening in the natural world and they actively argue that it's something that we shouldn't be worried about because it's something that just happens, um, it's God's law. So there's actually very, very little concern about extinction to begin with. But as the losses and extinctions mount in the 19th century, or as the feeling develops that, for instance, colonized peoples are endangered, the tone starts to shift. Throughout the 19th century, you know, activists such as the Aborigines Protection Society consistently argue that people do need to be protected. Um, one of the most mm. examples is the development of reservations. You know, the idea that uh, indigenous peoples, Aboriginal peoples, need to be protected from mm. uh, the impact and contamination that Western um, European imperialism has had upon them. Um, so there is a sense there are some people who are deeply worried about that. Um, but others, again, as I said before, are deeply unconcerned because they just see it as a kind, as as the natural order of, of of things. Almost, there are people that are quite happy to say, you know, actually, there's nothing we can do, or apart from ameliorate or make the best of of what we can and smooth the pillow for the dying race. So there's a whole range of responses um, throughout the 19th century that often, you know, that are deeply, deeply shocking to us. Um, even in the context of reservations, for instance, the issue mm. is never about giving land back or anything like that. It's always about finding some way to allow imperial expansion to, or imperial dispossession to continue whilst trying to ameliorate the worst effects of it on particular mm. colonised peoples. So these reservations were, uh, were, were part of... Um, this idea of preserving these disappearing races, but in no way giving back any land. It's definitely one of the arguments that is made when reservations are discussed. That's not the only reason reservations are set up, but one of the justifications that's provided for them is that it will enable, um, and sometimes when they are called for, is that it will offer a form of protection or it will offer a form of sanctuary. That's relatively mm. unusual um, because lots of people actually um, 
are quite in favour of assimilation, for instance, and not necessarily about having, um, you know, allowing people to have their own land in that respect either. Um, but it is it is something it is an argument that is made in favour of establishing reservations. I mean, conservation activists are warning that uh, we are living through the sixth mass extinction. Focus has primarily been on the impact on humans have had on the environment, but your research includes peoples, cultures and languages in this conversation are, uh, as being at risk and threatened to. Why do you think it's important that the threat to humans and nature are looked at together? Well, within the context of the 19th century, I think it allows us to see just how broadly ideas of extinction and endangerment become prevalent and the ways in which um, violent forms of colonial dispossession are naturalised as extinction. And I think that's really important because when most people think of extinction, they don't necessarily think of racism. They don't necessarily think of empire. They don't necessarily think of these kind of hierarchical ways that um, human beings have been understood and so on or, or about you know land rights and so on in indigenous context so i think it's really really important that that is understood alongside the kinds of extinction that we might bear in mind uh when we think of like whether it's the dinosaurs or cu the current biodiversity crisis because it's i mean especially as a historian for me it's really really important that we have that rounded mm. sense of what extinction means because again it has lasting legacies for all sorts of political issues in the in the here and now whether it's um the cu current biodiversity crisis and thinking about how we conserve um various species and how we go about making up for some of the absolutely devastating effects that humans have had on the planet or whether it's in terms of say contemporary land rights um for aboriginal peoples um you know and i think i think it's really really important to for that connected story um, to be brought together. I mean, we'll be going to audience questions soon, but um, do you think that policymakers and that um, people that are focusing on environmental policy should be looking at human extinction as well and, and nature together rather than as we look at now and just at, at um, rising seawaters, etc.? Um, well, there are ways in which they're connected. So, for instance, you know, if we're thinking about the climate crisis, some of the people who are likely to suffer the worst effects of those will be dispossessed peoples, um, whether that's formerly colonised peoples or not. So I think bearing that in mind in terms of histories is really, really important. Um, but there's also a way in which I think even if those stories remain disparate, that humanities scholars can play a part in those kinds of discussions. Because again, if we think of conservation as a purely technical scientific problem, we're actually missing out on the fact that who we who, what we choose to conserve is a political decision, it's a moral and ethical decision. And in order to mm. understand those issues, I would want you know humanity scholars to play a part in that, whether that's philosophers or historians and so on. So I think it's recognising that the humanities have something that's of importance in understanding what extinction means to us and then and how we make those decisions about how we move forward in terms of conserving the planet because i mean obviously there's a you know are many many people who deny things like the climate crisis and so on but i think broadly yeah. most people are really really shocked um and really deeply worried about our impact on the environment i mean just during lockdown this summer we've actually seen one of the best and kind of examples of our impact by showing what's happened during lockdown the momentarily mm. kind of recovering planet gives us a glimpse of both what we've done but also what we could do if we chose to act and in order to choose to act and make those kinds of decisions we need to hold our politicians to account as well as you know recognize that there is this political and ethical dimension within these to which the histories are relevant Sadia, thank you so much for such a fascinating conversation. I mean, you touched there on politicians denying, um, some people denying climate, the climate crisis. I mean, we've got world leaders denying the climate crisis, but um, we will now uh, open it up to audience questions. Um, and we've got a couple that have come in already. Um, 
This one um, strikes me as being very interesting. Can you, Sabia, can you please give a general sense of these shows? Was it like a curious, was it like a circus, like a zoo, like a lab or a festival setting, outdoors and family friendly, or a combination of all these things? I think it's, uh, the person there is touching on describing the atmosphere of these displays. So it really depends where you see performers. Sometimes people are exhibited in zoos. Um, so for instance, it's quite common when animals are put on display to have a foreign keeper, for instance, with them. Uh, sometimes people are put on display in a theatre, for instance, and then you might have a few people on stage with a painted backdrop, for instance, and it's much more the kind of thing that we would find familiar as a theatre show, but with a very, very kind of specific purpose. Um, Within the context of world fairs, we're talking about something like the Great Exhibition or the Chicago mm. World's Fair, um, where there's, uh, you know, entire villages that are set up. Um, actually, a really, really good example is um, um, the Eiffel Tower when it's first built. At the base of the tower, it's actually built um, for a world exhibition. There are actually villages of people and you can go to the exhibition and you can, you know, walk around the base of the Eiffel Tower and meet and greet lots of different peoples. So there are, and it, and it is definitely, very, very definitely thought of as a kind of family friendly show. Uh, families do go, when you see images of the shows and things like that, there are not just adults, but children there as well. Um, so it is very much a kind of entertainment for the masses and that's how it's marketed. Occasionally, they are also marketed as kind of scientific discussions or something. So you might have an evening lecture uh, with a mm. scientist, for instance, talking about um, the performers giving a lecture about, you know, their manners and customs. Um, and that will be much more like a sit down seated affair in a big lecture hall, for instance, with performers on stage. And so, so there's a real, there's a very, very different kind of, com there are many ways in which people are exhibited. And the, the exhibitions of people where that was family friendly, and then you'd have um, uh, the anthropologist sitting down and chatting with people. When was the last time an exhibition like that was held? I wouldn't want to say, but most people tend to think of it as the 1930s within the context of the world mm. there. But because these kinds of shows are ongoing, I wouldn't want to make a claim about something being the last of that kind. I mean, like I say, you know, my experience in Australia means that I'd be very, very reluctant to say that they've disappeared forever. Um, but what I do think changes is state involvement, for instance, like within the context of world fairs. Uh, these are ongoing, but yeah. people do not see world fairs as a, as a place where you can it, you know, necessarily go, um, where, where a state would feel that, I, you know, that it was to their benefit to put people on the parade in this kind of way. Um, so it's that kind of thing that changes, I think. And certainly from the late 19th, early 20th century onwards, anthropologists tend not to use the shows for scientific research anymore. And they become much more associated with spectacle, partly because, for instance, if you want to measure someone's head or something like that, you know, if you're a physical anthropologist, those shows can be important to give you access to, you know, people and living examples and so on. But mm. once anthropologists start asking different questions, so for instance, once they become much more interested in social networks, kinship groups and so on, then the shows mm. become much less useful because you don't necessarily import uh, a whole village of people. Um, and so you can't necessarily trace kinship in the way that anthropologists want. So once the questions they ask uh, mm. and that they are interested in change in the later 19th century then they themselves become less interested in the shows as avenues for their kind of research fascinating and um, we'll go to another audience question now um, do you know if there was any difference between how upper class british people saw race um, and different cultures in comparison to working class people Gosh, that's really tricky, because especially with respect to the shows, most working class people can't necessarily afford them. So they mm. are often quite neat forms of, uh, you know, they're often very, very expensive. Um, mm. They do become cheaper in the later 19th century, so you do get more and more working class people attending those shows. But again, it's really difficult to find sources from people, um, working class people describing their experiences. Most of the sources I found, 
in the 19th century were actually people writing for newspapers and so on, for instance. And it's and it would be very, very difficult from that to make broader generalisations about that. So they were marketed at the upper classes? Well, they're marketed to anyone who can afford it, but people who tend right. to be able to afford them are, are generally, <laughs> well, right. are generally well. middle class at the very least, yeah. because they are quite, you know, I mean, sometimes you do get exceptionally expensive um, shows where you would definitely have to be very, very wealthy. Um, but most of them, you know, tend to be, until the later 19th century, tend to be much, much more aimed at kind of middle class uh, affordability in that sense. Okay, well, um, another question. Is this idea of extinction um, of non-European peoples in any way related to Darwinism? Well, as I mentioned, Darwin does talk about extinction of non-European people, peoples in The Descent of Man, which is published in 1871. Um, and he's very, very clear that humans are organised hierarchically and yeah. that natural selection can occur at a group level and he's very clear that it can happen at the level of tribes nations races you know um so many people who do take up that idea um of hierarchical arrangements of people who are unequally matched so that when they come into contact with one another there's going to be inevitable conflict for instance but that idea is not necessarily Darwinian. It's actually quite common. Um, and it's so common that in the 1850s, for instance, people, there's, oh, I can't remember his name, there's an anthropologist um, who complains that actually anthropologists have become so used to this idea of endemic natural selection and naturalizing violence that they started to see themselves as, quote, pious manslayers. So mm. it's actually a much, much older idea than Darwin, but he's one of the most famous and important examples of somebody writing in the 1870s so explicitly about um, extinction in this in this way as a kind of natural process with respect to it, both ancient human beings and contemporary colonized peoples. Mm. Um, someone asking about um, the individuals who who were the displays. Did anyone, Sadia, do you know, did anyone try and attempt to escape or leave these exhibitions? Uh, I'm sure they did. Um, there are stories for instance, I'm not necessarily sure about escape in the sense of that, you know, the, there are definitely ways in which display peoples show their agency and object to the ways that they're put on show, for instance. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. So, for instance, sometimes it will be complaining about conditions. So, for instance, um, there's a troop of Indians that are displayed in the 1880s, for instance, where um, they constantly complain about being cold or something like that. Sometimes people will argue about pay, for instance. So, as well as Manios um, in 1853, there's another example I know of where um, there's reports in the press in the 1850s of an African man who is complaining about his pay. Um, and he feels that he's being underpaid. Um, so there, there are all sorts of ways in which display peoples absolutely object to the conditions of their displays um, mm. and seek to find better kinds of conditions. And that could be any number of ways, whether it's refusing to perform, um, whether it's um, striking out. So for instance, there's another example, um, I think it's the 1840s, where in a press report where there's um, a South African man on, so, um, he is on show and he's doing um, a performance with Spears and there's a man in the audience who basically is badgering him and the man on stage becomes very uncomfortable with this and he basically gets his spear and he shoots it through the guy's uh, shoots it at the guy uh, it might have gone through his hat or something like that but it causes, causes a huge furor um, and the, you know the show ends and that's an example again of somebody being on stage objecting to the way he is being treated by um, the audience who, who feel entitled um, to badger him in this kind of way. Um, so there are all sorts of ways in which we can see display peoples pushing back in, in that mm. kind of way against their treatment. We've touched there on um, um, people on display um, 
trying to escape or protesting. Is there any evidence of public controversy? Did some people object to uh, the displays as a problem? And this is, I assume this person is asking about the general public rather than those on display. Did anyone object? Was there any controversy regarding these exhibitions, Salvia? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are controversies right throughout the 19th century and you can find them with respect to most shows that, are, that take place. One of the most important and famous, for instance, is Sarah Bartman in the early 19th century, who I said, you know, she's put on display in 1810. And basically, you know, she's put on display just three years after the abolition of the British slave trade. And there's a real concern that she's enslaved. Um, and a very famous abolitionist, Zachary Macaulay, actually brings a court case where, because he's so concerned that she is enslaved. Um, mm. That court case is then heard. Um, a contract is presented that uh, is supposedly between her and her manager. It's very unclear whether she ever signed that contract or whether it was legitimate or not. But a contract, you know, is found and um, uh, presented to the court. The court dismisses the case and does not recognise Bartman as enslaved. But that's an example of, you know, somebody uh, objecting to the display and finding it so worrisome that they actually take that kind of action. And it's very, very common to find people that kind of concerned. Like, like I say, in the light, um, throughout the 19th century, the Aborigines Protection Society are consistently critical of these kinds of shows and often try to do mm. things, you know, um, whether it's just in the press and so on, that talk about how problematic these shows are and, are, and that argue that they're explo exploitative. So in the late 19th century, for instance, um, there's a show at Earl's Court, actually. It's quite extraordinary. Um, the whole of Earl's Court is made to look um, like an African village, and they have um, dozens and dozens of African performers on site. And the Aborigines Protection Society is very, very explicit that they see that show as enslavement, but just not something that's defined as that in legal terms. So they do use this language um, right yeah. throughout the 19th century. Gosh, fascinating. Um, can anthropology today be seen as distinct from its colonial roots? I mean, I that. That. <laughs> yeah, I think I think anthropologists would like that to be true, but I don't see any way that there has been such a break that we can see that it's dis that it is so distinctive that. Mm. that somehow those traces of colonialism don't remain um whether that's in the way for instance anthropological collections if we just think of museum collections and so on now you know these are incredibly important kinds of issues that museums are having to deal with lots of anthropology museums all over the world have human remains in them or objects in them that are still used for research or still put on show that were taken in these kinds of imperial contexts so many, many years ago, for instance, I was in um, Chicago for research and uh, I was going around the Field Museum and one of the cases was um, blacked over um, mm. because inside there were objects that were never intended for public display. Um, and they, ha they had done that because there had been objections from Indigenous peoples um, basically claiming their right to, to these people to mm. these objects and wanting them to be returned to, to them. So there are all, when those kinds of issues are so live about repatriation and so on, I don't mm. see that there's a distinct enough break to say that anthropology is not colonial. I think it absolutely is and continues to be. But that doesn't mean that it's colonial in the same way that it was necessarily. Um, in your, and you know, it's relationship to colonial um colonialism has changed in that respect but i think these the, the legacies of colonialism and so on are still absolutely being worked out especially with respect to things like repatriation and display uh, so increasingly museums do um you know do try and think about these kinds of issues and there are efforts to try and work with indigenous peoples or with what's often called source communities about how these objects should be displayed um, but that's not necessarily as common as it should be. I think the first time I saw that, an, a museum exhibition where mm. um, that was really, really obvious was in Melbourne several years ago. I was going, there's a huge gallery called First Peoples there. Mm. 
-hmm. And there were many, many labels there that said we, as in the Aboriginal people, we belong to this land or, you know, and that really was the first time I had seen a museum exhibition where the labels had been written by Aboriginal people and where that we was used. So, you know, talking about themselves rather than being talked about. And that is nowhere near as common as it should be. And um, we're running out of time with you, Sadia, but um, one final question before we end this session. Uh, this might be slightly putting you on the spot, uh, but someone has asked an, an uncomfortable thought, but I'm left wondering about the legacy of his 19th century ideas about extinction um, as a natural selection process in relation to certain views about herd immunity and COVID. Your thoughts, Sadia? Goodness me. Um, I think the most important ways in which we have seen those ideas play a part is about what, who is seen as being human and whose what life is worth seeing as living. Because what we're seeing in the way that the various kinds of governments are responding to COVID is a, is a profound disrespect for all kinds of lives. Uh, you know whether the, whether people are poor, whether they're uh, people of color, whether they're you know disabled and so on. We are seeing some of the most vulnerable people in society being forgotten about or neglected, and simply not being protected as they should be. And I think it's absolutely true that to say that some of those legacies come from long-term historical ideas about who is important and whose life is important. And those ideas are raced, gendered, and you know, in all sorts of ways, those kinds of they they play a part. But that I mean, that's a really, really complicated question, I think. But I think what the even more important that is that we do something to hold our politicians to account in that respect, because what is happening now, and the way that in you know communities like our elderly are being laid waste to, is simply shocking. Um, and, and it comes from a profound disrespect for other kinds of human beings. And that, I think, is deeply, deeply worrying. A complicated question, but you handled it very well. Thank you so much. Sadia, thank you again for giving up your time to talk to us and answering our questions with really interesting and fascinating answers. Thank you very much indeed. And to the wider thank audience. You so much. Thank, thank you, you Sadia. And to the and to the wider audience. A reminder that this is the first in a series of events titled Why History. The next event is on the 15th of October and you'll find details of that on the British Academy website. Thank you again to Sadia and thank you very much.